There is nothing more tantalising to the human species than a good mystery. Thrillers in the forms of novels, movies and even campfire tales are often consumed by the thousands who love the adrenaline rush of solving a mystery. However, some of the most pervasive mysteries are those that occur in real life, and these are the ones that are often most difficult to solve. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at mysterious discoveries. Impact Crater Mysteries Our moon features a gigantic crater. This hole has been on our moon for billions of years, since an unknown object hit the dark side of the moon. We have measured this crater to reach 1550 miles in width and 8 miles in depth, and so have dubbed it one of the largest craters within our solar system. The presumed explanation for decades was simply that this crater was formed when contact was made between the moon and a rapidly paced meteor. If this had been the case, then there would be pieces from the inside of the moon on the surface possibly available to examine. Some new insight was provided in January 2019, when the U-2 rover was sent to the moon from China, which reached the bottom of this mysterious crater. Minute traces of minerals were recorded by U-2 too, which appear to have come from within the moon's mantle. In a turn of events, new data came to light within August 2019 from a study published within Geophysical Research Letters. After an analysis was conducted upon the materials found at the bottom of this peculiar crater, it revealed evidence suggesting that the crater was composed entirely of crust, with no mantle. The crust is the outer layer surface of the moon, with the mantle coming just underneath that, similar to Earth. This would imply that an object collided with the moon with enough force to open a colossal crater, but with not enough force to release any of the mantle onto the surface of the moon. Co-author of the new study, Xiao Zhang, planetary scientist working at the China University of Geosciences, explained how the team had anticipated finding the mantle materials at this landing site. He goes on to explain that the lack of mantle organisms rules out the possibility that a meteor travelling with high velocity had caused this crater, eliminating an assumption we had been acting upon for decades. This study employed the use of spectroscopy in order to clarify and identify the minerals that had been found within the lunar soil. This process observes how each grain is reflected within both visible and near-infrared light. This study was carried out using the equipment U22 was already armed with, performing these reflection tests on six different areas of soil, ranging up to approximately 175 feet away from the landing site. An already established database allowed each mineral to be identified based upon size, reflectance and degradation, which often occurs as a result of solar wind. Within every sample, it was evident that the primary mineral in the moon's surface is plagioclase. We know this is common in the crusts of Earth and the Moon, but that it isn't likely to be found within the mantle. This mineral composition supports the meteor theory, but then the unanswered question remains as to what created this crater. If it were a meteor, then why aren't there chunks of mantle over the surface? The Mystery Man a mystery man was found deceased near a reservoir on Saddleworth Moor, Greater Manchester, England, in December 2015. His body was discovered lying on a track close to the summit of Indian's Head above the Dovestone Reservoir. The mystery of the unidentified stranger was compelling. He had no ID, no wallet, no mobile phone and no obvious connection to the area in which he was found. The only clue they could find was three train tickets in his coat pocket. £130 in £10 notes, and a medication box for hypothyroidism treatment. It was treated as non-suspicious by the police and gave rise to numerous theories, with the story spreading globally. Officers said that the mysterious man was last seen near the location where he was found by walkers around 4.30pm the previous day. The tickets found in his pocket suggested that he travelled from London Ealing to Manchester Piccadilly the day before he was discovered. One ticket was from Ealing Broadway train station at 9.04am, 
and the other was from London Euston to Piccadilly, bought at 9.50 a.m. Pictures of the man were released, but these only showed him at the train station, giving no real insight into the identity of the stranger. The next confirmed sighting of the mystery man was in the Clarence pub in Greenfield, Saddleworth, asking the landlord Melvin Robinson the way to the top of the mountain. He was given the moniker Neil Dovestone as they continued the search for his identity. The mystery deepened as toxicology reports in March 2016 noted that Neil Dovestone passed away from a dose of strychnine, a toxic odorless pesticide used to end the life of rats. This is a favourite in the mystery novels of Agatha Christie and is illegal to buy in the UK. Theories surrounding Neil Dovestone's passing circulated, a favourite being that he was a survivor of a 1949 plane crash near where he was discovered and undertook a pilgrimage to the site. A full 13 months after his body was discovered, Neil Dovestone was officially identified as 67-year-old David Lytton. A metal plate in his left thigh was traced back to a procedure in Pakistan, was a key clue in discovering his identity, amongst other breadcrumbs that pointed to the country. On the 10th of December 2015, Lytton boarded a plane in Lahore and travelled almost 4,000 miles to London Heathrow. Once police identified images at Heathrow and matched Neil Dovestone to passenger records, they were able to trace a relative and get a DNA sample, which led to a positive identification. David Lytton had been living in Pakistan for 10 years before returning to the UK and heading to Saddleworth. While the identity of the mysterious body of Neil Dovestone has been unearthed, a mystery still surrounds why he returned to England and went to Saddleworth, and how he passed away of pesticide poisoning. One theory suggests that he took it himself, but these will be questions that remain unanswered. London's Haunted Underground London is an incredibly old city with a rich history and countless numbers of ghost sightings. The underground especially is a frequent hotspot for the paranormal, so much so that they even made haunted tube maps of all the spooky sightings. Covent Garden Station has been haunted for over a century. Since it first opened, people have been seeing a tall figure wearing a top hat, gloves and a cloak or coat. It is believed to be the deceased William Terrace, an actor who was attacked and lost his life in 1897 relatively nearby the station. This ghost-like figure is apparently so unnerving that multiple staff of the London Underground have requested transfers to avoid him. Bethnal Green Station was used as a shelter during the World War II air raids. In 1943, there was an alarm test drill which many thought was a real attack. They swarmed the station and 173 people ended up passing away from the stampede. Most of the deceased were women and children. It is said that screams can be heard at the station despite there being no one around. Supernatural occurrences have been seen near the ground of Elephant and Castle Station. While waiting on empty platforms, commuters have heard running footsteps and odd tapping sounds as well as seeing doors flung open and slam shut. There have been many reports of a young girl boarding the Bakerloo line but never seen exiting. The drivers at this station have even claimed to see the girl board their train themselves, further adding to the myth of this mystery ghost. Aldgate Station sits on top of what used to be a burial pit for those who passed away of the plague. This burial site is the cause of many ghost sightings within the station. It even has its own ghost logbook to keep track of them all. The most well-known ghost sighting is that of an elderly woman seen helping an injured man. A worker apparently fell onto the live electrical rail from a considerable height and was injured. Thankfully, he survived, but witnesses claimed that they saw a ghost-like figure stroking him while he laid there. She was quickly dubbed as the Elderly Angel of Oldgate, and is quite a famous phenomenon. There have even been sightings of ghost trains on the London Underground. In 1928, in the South Kensington Underground Station, a commuter was waiting alone on the platform for the last train to pull in. A certain train pulled in with a whistle and passed through the tunnels. Clinging to the side of the train was a ghost-like figure clad in a coat and peaked hat. 
Apparently, the witness's description of it matched none of the existing and operating trains. There have been multiple sightings of this ghost train over the years, with the most recent one being in 2013. The London Underground has been serving the city for more than 150 years. It has been built on graves, suffered through wars, and has had many accidents occur upon its grounds. It's no wonder there are hundreds of ghost stories and sightings. What did Jesus look like? Ever since Christianity sowed its seeds into the ground of common culture, the question of what did Jesus Christ look like has accompanied it. The Bible itself offers little insight, but for the past few centuries, a specific image of Jesus has become a staple in the Western and European world. Fair skin, wavy chestnut hair that falls down to his chest, a beard, and more often than not, eyes of crystal blue. This is the view of Jesus which has been passed down for generations, depicted as such in a myriad of devotional pieces and church stained glass windows. This version of Jesus is recognizable anywhere, and yet it's not an accurate depiction. Several aspects feed into why this version of Jesus, which we're all so accustomed to, even exists, though it's believed it began in the Byzantine era during the 4th century AD. The Byzantines portrayed Jesus in a symbolic manner. They valued meaning and creative significance above realism. In fact, the clothing worn by Jesus in many depictions is reminiscent of robes worn by Hellenic pagan gods use, as the early portrayals of Christ were inspired by pagan artworks and grandiose devotional sculptures. Long, wavy hair and beards were a symbol, then, of divinity and godhood. The artists of the Byzantine Empire wished to make Jesus akin to a younger Zeus. Most interestingly, when early Christians were not depicting Jesus as the divine ruler of heaven, they tended to portray him as a man normal in most ways, that is to say, short-haired and not bearded, though beards were thought to make philosophers and sage men stand out amongst the common people. Epictetus, a Stoic philosopher, considered beards to be appropriate according to nature for men of wisdom. It's long been speculated that our modern image of Jesus is actually based on the infamous son of the sinful Pope, as it is around the height of his glory that paintings of Jesus begin to resemble a more Western European depiction which looks suspiciously like the papal commander. However, there is a lack of conclusive evidence that could prove this to be the truth, so speculations are all we have in regard to this theory. Richard Neve, a forensic anthropologist, took part in a BBC documentary, Son of God, in 2001, for which he created a digital model of a Galilean man. Neve did not claim this to be a recreation of Jesus Christ's face and explained that it was meant to merely spark the idea that, maybe, Jesus would have been a man of his region and time, that is to say, not the Western depiction we've come to recognize. For his model, he used an authentic skull discovered in the area. Robert Cargill, an assistant professor of classical civilizations and religion at the University of Iowa, stated, We don't know what Jesus looked like, but if all of the things that we do know about him are true, he was a Palestinian Jewish man living in Galilee in the first century. So, he would have looked like a Palestinian Jewish man of the first century. He would have looked like a Jewish Galilean. Highgate Cemetery, London, UK Just the word cemetery is capable of sending chills down some people's spines. Generally speaking, humans tend to find things associated with loss of life rather creepy, and the story behind Highgate Cemetery is not likely to alter their impression. Highgate Cemetery is chilling enough in pictures, let alone in real life. Built in the 1830s, the cemetery is the burial place of 170,000 people. Amongst them are the singer George Michael, political philosopher Karl Marx, South African anti-apartheid campaigner Yusuf Dadu, and scientist Michael Faraday. The cemetery, situated in North London, covers some 37 acres. Its spectacular Gothic architecture made it a fashionable place to be buried in Victorian England. Coincidentally, the same era that ghost stories and Gothic fiction began to rise in creativity and subsequently popularity. 
works such as Bram Stoker's Dracula, Edgar Allan Poe's poem The Raven, Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, and Henry James's The Turn of the Screw were all published between 1837 and 1901, owing to the reinterpretation of horror in Victorian times. It wasn't until the 1970s, however, that the most famous haunting story arose out of Highgate. In the late 1960s, Highgate Cemetery fell victim to vandalism. In fact, the tomb of Karl Marx had survived two attempted explosive strikes. In 1968, a group of young occult enthusiasts began visiting the cemetery, following various reports of paranormal activity in the cemetery. This activity included sightings of the deceased rising from sealed graves, phantoms drifting around the cemetery, and even an attack on a teenager, leaving physical scars. In the same year the group visited, what was described as a desecration of one grave was discovered. It was not known whether the occult group had anything to do with this, but the scene discovered was horrendous nonetheless. According to reports in the London Evening News, an unknown person arranged flowers taken from graves in circular patterns with arrows of blooms pointing to a new grave, which was uncovered. A coffin was opened and the body inside was disturbed. But their most gruesome act was driving an iron stake in the form of a cross through the lid and into the chest of the corpse. In the years following the bizarre finding, bodies of deceased animals with slashed throats began to appear in the cemetery. And when a local newspaper published the story of a man named David Farrant in February 1970, the Highgate vampire myth was further fueled. David Farrant had reported seeing a grey figure wandering amongst the tombstones that he believed to be supernatural. Soon after, David Farrant entered into a bitter ghost-hunting dispute with self-proclaimed exorcist Sean Manchester. Sean Manchester declared the phantom a vampire and the pair set about hunting it down. David Farrant was later arrested and the ordeal ended in 1973 when Sean Manchester allegedly drove a stake through the beast's heart in the House of Dracula in Crouch End, London. The legend, however, lives on to this day. But what do you make of these mysteries and disappearances? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.